go to Mali. Oh no, 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 we had, we had Kudu. Yeah. So it means let me go to my one now. Yeah, but you extended it. You said we. Nah, but those were you, you weird said, arguments. Yeah, but. I said okay. 10 minutes. Okay. We, let's do the, okay. the Quran presentation okay. and the Bible presentation. Okay, but are you going to bring up particular like, as in the, 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 like this? Because I haven't prepared for all. No, if. Yeah? No, do it off the top of your head. Okay, okay. Yeah. yeah, if there's something I need to. Like, sometimes I have hadiths and stuff, and if you don't know, you don't know. Okay. So essentially. No, no, but wait, you've had two uh, topics already. Okay. So let me have it. Uh, let me do the. Uh, yeah? We did a. Uh, Preservation of the. Oh, do you want to time it? Yeah, we can do the Bible one. We'll yeah. do the Quran, the Quran after, because that's what I said. So you, you could just have two discussions on the Yeah, so, so I'm saying, okay, this is what I'm saying. Okay, can we finish off the discussion which I wanted to discuss with, with the guy there? You know these words, I'm not trying to make it to debate. I just don't understand like what Christians understand of these words, persons, essence, okay. and stuff. Right, we'll do that, but let's just, what we're going for, disagree. What? So, when I started, I said I just had a quick question that would take 10 minutes and we can have a discussion. And we said the, the, the preservation of the Quran, and you said, can we do the okay, preservation well, of the Bible? Make your argument. No, so I'm just saying, so that's why we can do the preservation of the Bible, but let's also do the preservation of the Quran, because that's what happens. I okay, said do, you want to, do you want to have like a time? How do you want to do this? Do you want a time slot or what, what, what you want to say? But, Okay, so the the Trinity. Right. Uh, the argument you lot always bring up is that that the you know Trinity is then in the Bible. Right. Where is it for you in the Bible in the way that you understand the Trinity? So so first probably the best place to start is what do you understand of the Trinity? As in what's its definition? And how does this go back purely to the Bible, or is it your belief is that it doesn't go back to the Bible? So in terms of the the, the, the Nicene Creed. That there is one God and there are three persons and that they are co-equal. That terminology is then taken, is then ascribed after the New Testament. But what it does, it, it describes what is prevalent within God's revelation from the reading of Genesis to Revelation. So it's taken from, a, from the hermeneutics of the scripture because Muslims want to see clear cut straight verses that say God has to say I am a trinity that's not how we take hermeneutics even as Muslims no but even understand. the idea I get that right. but even the idea loosely right. that the three are equal for example how does one get around so, the verse yeah, where it says let, let's just first establish it. Does, this, does the scripture identify God the Holy Spirit and Jesus as divine so that's the first point. Okay. So do, you, do, you, do, you, do you agree that the Bible okay, does so, so I'll explain it then. So to a degree it does. For example, John. No, no, no. Okay. No, what's that? No, <laughs> well, at no, least no. You're, no. But at least you're, you said <laughs> yeah, to an extent. Yeah, yeah. Because yeah. at least you're yeah. being honest. Yeah, yeah. Most Muslims no, no, will say it No, no, because there's two types of divinity which we find. Right. Yeah? In Roman pagan religion, okay. Dios which is when that God comes down to earth, right. yeah? And you have the other one where it's, uh, so there's you Dios it and there's a... No, what's the guy explain? There's two types of divinity. One where man, hyper... Uh, um, when a man hyper... What's the word for God? Hypersasis. No, no, when a man becomes God, like Jesus, uh, like Caesar, in the year 40, okay. they, they, in the Senate, they... Huh? AP. Yeah, apothos... Apo, oh, I forgot the word completely, yeah? Okay. Anyway, it's when men became gods in Greek uh, pagan society, okay. and also they had the idea when gods became man. So you now both the of Trinity these ideas taken from paganism, Greek paganism. Uh, I, I don't. Yeah, I really, really do think that. Okay. So in response to that, and I'll go into the Bible as well. Obviously, this is why. No, I no, no. But, but what would you be your contention there? I haven't built up an argument. Or yeah. Yeah, apotheosis. Yeah, apotheosis. Of, yeah. So you know what apotheosis is? Because you're saying I think it's taken from Greek and pagan. Do no. you know what apotheosis is? No, but I'm just saying because if the no, Trinity... Do you know, but do you know what apotheosis is? Well, you've just described it. Okay, apotheosis is a process where man in Greek society, and you can check it, Caesar, who lived before Jesus, 
was taken from the rank of Caesar or man into the rank of God. And this is just two years after his death. According to a vote in the Senate, they said that Caesar is deserving to be God. And this is the same thing that Bart Ehrman speaks about Jesus in the first three Gospels, Mark, Matthew and Luke, that he was adopted. An adoption of Jesus' uh, sonship you know, to God, it comes later each time. You know, so by the time you read the Gospel of John, which is written much later, it's the last of the Gospels, written in Ephesus, Jesus becomes a Logos. Now, what does Logos mean? A God or a word or a wisdom. It can mean many things. It was the intermediate between God and man. So this uh, Logos never existed before. And this is what I mean is a type of divinity, but only in John. Yeah, he, it's a divinity in uh, uh, adopted son, yes, as well. But, but not this, God Almighty the Father. Yeah, but this, Do you understand? Yeah, but this concept of the Logos. So I say it's, it's definitely in paganism. Yeah, but okay, so you said a lot. So I'm going to have to break down what you said. So, first of all, uh, the reason why I asked you this question is because this is a misconception that, especially within Islamic narratives, not even just Islamic, but certain people trying to attack the Christianity say, well, it's taken from Zeus and whatnot. And I have two scholars. No, I said Caesar. What yeah. Armin says? It. Yeah, but I'm saying that I'm in my response. I have two scholars. One is called Benjamin Summer. Who's that? He's a professor of Bible and ancient Semitic languages at the um, Department of, he the, the okay. Department of uh, Hebrew University. Okay. So, this is a renowned Jewish scholar. I've never heard of him. You can, you've you can never look heard him up. Of him. You've, apart from this, you've never heard of him. And this is what he, he said. And this is what he said. But well, Ehrman, you've heard him. I'm going, and I'm going to give you two. Go ahead. He says, some Jews okay. regard Christianity's claim to be a monotheistic religion with grave suspicion. Both because of the doctrine of the Trinity, how can three equal one? And because of Christianity's core belief that God took a bodily form. This is what he says, no Jew, sensitive to Judaism's own classical sources, however, can find the fault with the theological model that Christianity employs when it avows a belief in a God who has an earthly body as well as a Holy Spirit and a heavenly manifestation. For that model, we have seen as a perfectly Jewish one. So what he tried to say is he's got a book on it. He looks at the classical Jewish literature. How is God defined? Where do these concepts come from? And he is saying, actually, within Second Temple Judaism, you have this theological model where Jews, almost in the sense of similar to Salaf, some Salafis that say Shamsi, where they take things, and they affirm in the literal sense, they don't take things as metaphorical. Akita, so, yeah, so not they, in literal, so in, in the actual sense. Right, so exactly. So when they're looking at the text, the text that describe God in anthropomorphic senses, they always took as literal. So in his That's research, what Shams does, by the way. Well, they affirm it as literal, but they say, we don't know how. It's so a in a sense, yeah, you're right. Key. So yeah, I'm so saying, yeah. through his I'm research, yeah. he came to the same conclusion. And I have another scholar. His name is Peter Schaefer. What does it say about him? Let me just respond. Who are these scholars? Right. Yeah. Princeton University. So, so, so what is the crux you're saying that? Yeah, let me just finish yeah, point. He's from Princeton University. Mm -hmm. It says, Peter Schaefer is... A, is the leading scholar of rabbinic Judaism and early Jewish mysticism in the world today. So these are people who are qualified within this subject. And Kabbalah, what does he say? In his, what, what does he say in his book, Two Gods in Heaven? He says, the New Testament took up these traditions that existed in Judaism yes. and did not reinvent, yes. but instead expanded and deepened them. The elevation of Jesus of Nazareth. As the firstborn before all creation, the God incarnate, yeah. Son of God, Son of Man, the Messiah, all these basic Christological premises are not pagan or other kinds of aberrations. They are rooted in Second Temple Judaism, regardless of their specifically Christian character. So what he's saying here is when you look at, for example, the Mishnah, you have uh, the Targums, you have the Old Testament, they look at, and these are scholars, and they're both leaders in their field, and they yeah. come to the conclusion that the theological model yeah. of Christianity and the Trinity is not taken from paganism, because it's epistemology yeah. is how do we come yes, to so knowledge. Yes, it's not taken from paganism. Yes, that's what I just read. Uh, I can that it's not it. taken from paganism. Yes. 
Okay. So, so, so what he says, it's taken from Second Temple Judaism. Okay. Which means the that idea the that you should worship something else. Okay. Right. So the, the, can I just come back now? Okay. The idea that the Jews worshiping something other than God Almighty isn't something new, but it doesn't make it correct. This is the thing. You're talking about Second Temple Judaism. Right. The when Jews, the, the, as you second know, Second Temple Judaism. You when? Know the period. Yeah, yeah. It's, yeah. it's when Jesus the right, Bible exactly. was here, of course. Right. Yeah, yeah. So, so anyway, going back here, so this is a later Judaism. And this is after when Moses saw that the Jews were worshipping the cows. But now I can point to you and say, look, the Jews worship a cow or cow aside from God Almighty in First Temple Jerusalem. Does that justify it? No. Why? Because the scripture told to them was worship your God, the one and only your God. So I'm referring to the, to the scripture. You're referring to some dubious, no offense, scholars talking about what happened within the Jude, uh, Jewish community in the second in the history right. so the temple. Question would be, but it does not matter. So the no, one second, one second. They also, not just the cow, they also, if you know, in the time of Jesus also, worship angels. Are you aware of that? But it does not make it legitimate. So you again just telling me this stuff that um, that they worship other things. Even the Logos, for example, Philo was a Jew, uh, was a Jew, and he took the the the, the Logos as a form of divinity, a wisdom, a part of God, but he separated it from God. Again, you can for him you could have more than one divinity, but it does not make it right. So you are pointing to the people. I'm pointing to what God is saying. Is and the, God is saying you should this, worship only one the, God. And this is the fallacy of your argument. Yeah? You're arguing to a presupposition. What's First that? of all, a presupposition <laughs> is a fixed idea of something. Yeah, yeah. So because you believe God is one yeah. and it, in the Unitarian God, yeah. you then look at anything and say, because it says God is one, yeah. it must affirm or correlate to your understanding of monotheism. Because Christians are monotheists but we are Trinitarians we're not Unitarians that believe God is one person so your presupposition is that Jews identified they didn't have any belief in okay, it when you and say so it's good this up, I do understand when you say presupposition, so for me to say God says God is one which you should Christian, only worship which Christian says yeah. God isn't one Oh, so no, no, but you're just talking about something. Yeah, so for me to say, for example, yeah, for me clarify. to say... To so, yeah, I'll, I'll clarify. Because you assume that when we say there's a uh, Holy Spirit, a Trinity, that's associated with partners, which is polytheism. Yeah. That's, my, yeah. that's your presupposition. Yeah, yeah. That's what I'm saying. Because your presupposition is that if... Because your presupposition comes from the Quran. Say, say, the, the cis, say not three. Yeah. That's where your presupposition okay. is. So I'm saying to you, but I don't let, need that as a presupposition. Yes, of course it is. As a Jew, saying, he rejects it. As a Jew, right. they don't need the Quran to tell them that to you. Use that as their. But that's what I'm saying. So that's why I gave you a Princeton University scholar and a Jewish scholar yeah. who is more reputable than many, you know, yourself. Listen, or, listen, no, listen. But let me finish my Bart point. Erman, yeah, but let me Bart finish Erman. Yeah, let me just finish my okay, point. Sorry, sorry. What I'm trying to say is, Bart Ehrman has not even researched um, classical Jewish texts. He may have looked at the New Testament. He may have looked at the Old Testament. These are people, and I, I, that's why I read you his biography. He is the leading scholar in rabbinical Judaism. That means he read all the classical texts, and he comes to a conclusion. Because we know in academia, you cannot just make up anything from the willy-nilly. Everything you claim has to be substantial. So this is what I'm saying. You look in the passages, for example, I'll show you, um, I'll give you one passage in the Bible, and I'll give you an example. Anyway, anyway, can I just, just, <laughs> yeah, I don't just, know where you're going. Look, at yeah, the I'm, time of Caesar, yeah, but, yeah. at the time oh, oh, of Caesar... We can Caesar, do it time, so, no, no, so you have time to speak. And no, no, I, but it's like, um, it yes. goes completely off. At the time of Caesar, there was right. a process called apotheosis, yes. where men became gods. Right. It wasn't something unusual. Right. And gods also, in the pagan religion, became men. And the Jesus, uh, he was worshipped aside. Uh, the, uh, one, one of the scholars recently passed away, I think it's 2009. I forget his name, he wrote a book about Jesus' worship, yeah? That the Christians started to take Jesus in worship. But prior to that, it was only God. But because they took someone in worship does not mean they made him a God. But then in the Council of Nicaea, they had to justify. How do we worship Jesus but still maintain that there's only one God? So they had to say that there was one God but in different persons. And the spirit in itself was argued whether that was part of uh, the Trinity until much later on. Yeah. And it shows. So, and do you yeah, know in some... Nice, yeah, in in, in some, some, 
Constantinople like the Constantinople Colo 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 Coloridians, like the Coloridians, right. do you know who the Colo Coloridians are? Yeah, they're not the early Christian sect that also took Mary okay. as a person of worship. Right. So Christians, uh, you read any of the heresology, they were worshiping anyone and everything, early sects. Right. The Christian in what you have today wasn't what it was today. Tell me if you're so, wrong. So, so let me ask you a question. No, no, before, but I was, I was just saying that before. So are you trying to argue that the text affirms Jesus is, is God and that the people creating the text then inserted this into the text or it came no, no. after the Christian text? Christianity, right. yeah, Christianity does not come from the Bible. The Bible comes from Christianity. Now, what do I mean like right. that? One, one second, I'll explain right. what I mean. So when Jesus, according to you, passed away, or was resurrected, what happened was a number of Christianities arose, opposite to what Eusebius says in his Ecclesi Ecclesiastical, that there was one Orthodox Church. No, this is not true. There were multiple Christianities with multiple books by multiple uh, authors whom we don't know who wrote them, yeah? And they used to fight each other in regards to authors. And what happened in the Council of Nicaea, they uh, under so, so in terms of, so in terms of the so one second. Well, in that council, they agreed, even though it was a part, you know, the uh, Arians, the semi Arians, uh, and the Trinitarians, they had a debate about the essence of God, yeah, whether God was three persons in one or with the two essences, and so on, yeah. And only after that, the Bible was compiled. Yeah. After Marcion of Rome or no, Synod, the, yes, the Bible, the, the Bible was compiled, the, the, compiled the, the, together. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. So we don't know who wrote this book. Right. There's many, many books but, floating but, around. But were the Gospels in circulation already? Y yes, loads of right. Gospels. Okay. So the Apocrypha and more than that that we've lost. have never been disputed. No scholar would disagree with what that. What do you mean by that? In terms of they have always been accepted by the Christian community. In terms of... No, so, some right. Christian communities do not accept certain such, things. Such uh, like for example, Marcion of right. Rome, again, the one... The Marcionites, they only took uh, the Gospel of Luke. They said all the others forget it, and they took only the letters of Paul. Do you know about this? Because why? Because they believe that the God of the Old Testament, and this is what Christianity leads to, it leads into either Bitarianism or Trinitarianism right. or some kind but of. We're, we're kind of going well, no, 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 no. The reason no, no, why. No, 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 no. Once it's an interesting topic there. Yeah? Marcion, he was. You're making a lot of points, that's why. That's why I'm trying to, like. No, but you asked Inter me, that's right. Interject, yes. Yeah, I'll, I'll the last point, yeah? The reason point, why I want yeah? to interject. Last point, and I'll give it to you. Yeah. Yeah. Master, it's, it's the compilation, because yeah, the point... To, sorry, I know I'm interrupting, but it's better to have a dialogue, because what I'm trying to clarify from you is in terms of the scriptures, what we have now, mm. the four Gospels, yeah. and the book, are you saying mm. the Christians invented what is in the text, or are you saying that the text is authentic? Because the reason why I'm asking you this, yeah. if you believe the Christians yeah. corrupted the book, yeah. the primary reason you corrupt something yeah. is to support your own theology. For example, Shias have their own hadith, which talk about the imams. I'll, I'll right. answer you, yeah, I'll answer right. you yeah. so okay. let, Yes, let it is yeah, corrupted. But, yeah, but let me, okay, go on. So, yes, it is corrupted, right. and the scholars of Christianity, right. They so, know this is, so what is what for the example, of corruption? For example, many things were could have been. Yeah, but it could have been it could have been mistakes okay. or could be viable uh, actual changes to the scriptures, yeah, right. which were done theologically. Right. An example so, of so, that. So this is my point. And let me finish uh, the point. Uh, you asked, you are you saying because you did. If they change, give, well, you yeah. know where scholars know yeah. that the so, Bible has been changed. So I'll finish my point. Gospels, so, and yeah? then you respond. So the reason why I was asking you that is if you. I, and I, that's why I mentioned the Shias. They Forget the Shias. Yeah, no, but I'm giving you, I'm giving you a, a analogy. Shias accuse Sunnis of corrupting Hadith to support the Sunni theology. She, Sunnis accuse Shias of corrupting Hadith to support their own Shia theology, stuff that represent the Imams or whatever. So I'm saying the core principle of corruption when you add to a text is to support your theology. So if the Christians yeah. then corrupted the Bible to support their theology, yeah then the reason would be that the what Bible we have now was sufficient for them to establish that it claims that Jesus is God and there is a trinity. You would not corrupt a text to support your theology, then it, then it goes against your okay, theology. Okay, so I'll explain, right. yeah? So the corruption of scripture. Right. Now, Bart Ehrman, again, but he mentioned there are multiple groups. He mentioned four okay. in particular, yeah? That corruption. When you say Christian, you're talking about Trinitarian, present-day, yeah. modern Christianity. Right. No, Christianity was never one... No, no, let, let me speak yeah, this yeah. to you, yeah? Christianity, as you're trying to portray, it was never like this. 
there were, when Jesus came and as you say he died, there were multiple Christianities with multi, multiple theologies and multiple books. At the end of the day, they had to debate and argue as to which one was the orthodox. And once orthodoxy was established, not by truth but by numbers, in the Council of Nicaea, the Bible was compiled. And this is following a heretic known as Marcion of Sinop. When he came with the Gospel of Luke, uh, I'll, I'll be very quick. No, that's fine. Let's just time for it. Let's time it. Yeah, yeah. Oh, so he came with the Gospel of Luke and a truncate and... And he, okay. ca he came with the Gospel of Luke and he had only some of the uh, letters of uh, Paul. And only then afterwards, the church, after the Council of Nicaea, after the argument for orthodoxy, they said this is what Christian orthodox is. And thereafter, they made all other, uh, all other Christianities illegal. Okay. Are you, is there anything I'd said wrong about that? No, that's fine. That let you me, could challenge? Let me respond. Okay, so I'll do two minutes. Should I time it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because otherwise it's going to go a bit all over the place. Yeah, yeah sure. And we're going to be talking over each other. Yeah. Okay, so again, I, I, I asked specific questions and I asked what was the purpose of corruption? He spoke about the different books being compiled together. My main point was this. If the Christians are, as Muslims do, accuse the Christians of corrupting the text, then the primary reason for corrupting a book is to support your te theology. So then they're still going to, into the same book to say, well, the book doesn't support your theology. So then the question I'm asking is a simple question. What is the point of corrupting the book? Because if the book is corrupted, then the Christians were sufficient with it affirming that Jesus was God and there's enough evidence in it to affirm that there's a trinity. This is why I brought the uh, example of Shia. Shia use Hadith which supports their own theology. They accuse the Sunnis of using uh, Hadith which support their own theology. Sunni accused the Shias of doing the exact same thing. So I'm saying before we get, even get into the crux of it, let's establish a uh, criteria. Is the book corrupted? Yes or no? And if it's corrupted, why was it corrupted? Because this is what epistemology is. It's to get to know, to understand and know everything. So the fact that there was discussion on which books to include highlights that there was actually genuineness in terms of holding certain books as holy and scripture. That's why there was never within orthodoxy a disagreement within what we can see in terms of the four gospels that was always agreed upon. Even within the different denominations, they all agree on the 27 books. The reason why there are different books within Catholicism, Orthodox, Protestant is because of books within the Old Testament, but there's not been any disagreement currently within the Tawhido Ethiopian Church, the Catholic Church, the Protestant Church. They all agree on the 27 books of the New Testament. So then when we go into the New Testament, the Old Testament, for example, to support the idea of the Trinity, and that's why I appeal to scholars, because they have done their research on where does the concept of the Trinity come from, and they even claim, and I can bring references, that this comes from pre-Roman times. So my claim originally was the concept of apotheosis is when a man becomes yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, is a man becomes God. And this was seen in the case of Caesar who lived before Jesus. And Jesus, the same thing happened. And you can see it in the Gospels. When one reads from Mark, you see a very human like Jesus. You pick up Luke and Matthew, you see that he becomes the son of God at the baptism. By the time you get to John, which is the last and furthest uh, Gospel written away from Jesus, he's become a Logos. In the beginning was the Word, the Word was... With, and in all of the other Gospels, they failed to mention this. Now, in regards to... Uh, why would this be? If something... Uh, you think that if something happened, the earlier witnesses to the event would be able to say this. But we don't have any of the earlier events. We don't have the sources of Matthew and Luke, which are L and M, or uh, Q, the source Q, talking about any of this stuff. We only have a much later gospel written in pagan Rome, which is John talking about Jesus being a Logos. And prior to him, there was Caesar. And Caesar went through a process known as apotheosis, where the council said to him, or the Senate, that you will become, well, after he was dead, they voted him to become a divine person, a God. And the same thing happened in Jesus. Now, in regards to the Gospels being corrupted, you know they're corrupted. You know the corrupted the ending of Mark, the footnotes of any Bible says it's corrupted. So you're giving this long spiel about the Bible not being uh, 
corrupted, you know it's been corrupted. And there are multiple Christianities, as I mentioned, like the Dossetians who said that Jesus was not in flesh. You see that their corruptions enter into the Bible. If you read the Gospel of John, which is said to be an argument against this Dossetians, you continue to see, see it say, Jesus in flesh, Jesus in flesh. Why do we see that? It's because they're arguing against Dossetians. And this is why one of the reasons, one of the scholars, Bart Ehrman in particular, he mentions the Dossetians as uh, interpolating the Bible. So there are multiple groups before, and orthodoxy makes no sense. You spoke about orthodoxy, it makes no sense before Freer 300. Right, so in response, he's tried to then now accuse that Christians have this higher Christology at some point, starting from the book of Mark, then going all the way to John, where there's more explicit statements, which he even agreed do seem to indicate that Jesus is God. So therefore... No, no, no. What divine. is it? Divine. divine. So That's therefore, the difference. So even if Jesus divine. is divine, this then goes against even Islamic teaching. That no, I don't believe in it. Right. That's <laughs> fine. Right. But it. again... I don't believe in it. Yeah, yeah, let me... Yeah, let me, let me no, no, you can start so, his time again. So, I just need him to be... For example, he's making Start many, his time again, I don't mind. So he's making many wild claims because there were other Christian sects. We even read the Bible and we know there were her heresies started to creep in. So these weren't the original Christians. What was the original? How does he know they were the original Christians? He's making assumptions. We have the preserved text. We know what orthodoxy was. We know Jesus was crucified. We know who the apostles were. We know who Paul was. These are all people who are testified. He appeals to scholars, but what do they use as evidence of Christianity and historicity of the crucifixion, they use the Gospels. Why? Because these are the earliest sources that we have. They even approximate the, the writings to around 40 AD to 100 AD. So then we look, for example, we look at the book of um, John, sorry, the book of Luke, and it talks about, for example, Jesus refers to um, I, um, John being the voice in the wilderness. But then we see, for example, in the Old Testament, Isaiah 40 verse 3 it says there's going to be one in the wilderness who prepares the way before me so did the Christians corrupt the Isaiah as well because we see in the Dead Sea Scrolls these are things that predate Christianity so it says explicitly there's going to be one in the wilderness who comes before me who is talking God is speaking we go to Malachi 3 verse 1 it says I will behold I will send my messenger before me who was that messenger? John the Baptist. So who then is coming after John the Baptist? It was Christ. This is what Christians use to decipher who Jesus was. So again, we look at pre-Christian texts that indicate God was coming to earth. And this is why, even if we compare to Islam, Islam is the one that has corrupted this uh, theology of God. Why? Because they say God cannot enter creation. But we read all the prophets. The prophets say Abraham saw God. Moses saw God, Isaiah saw God. So why, why do we have this narrative change? So that's why I'm saying, let's get this Islamic presupposition yeah, yeah, out of the way. Yeah, I'm completely baffled, yeah. We're talking about Trinity and right. the concept that you argued, you know, you argued that, yeah, yeah, you argued that the idea of Trinity is right. not taken against paganism. But I told you, it's there, Caesar, he went through a process of apotheosis, it's historically written, it's not taken from the Gospels, and we know every scholar worth his dime knows there's a rise in Christology, yeah, in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and then, uh, sorry, Mark, Matthew, Luke, and then John. The later the writer writes, the more of a God Jesus becomes, or a divinity. I never say that Jesus is a God according to the Gospels. I say that according to uh, John, which is the last of the Gospels which are written, uh, in about the year 85 to 90, yeah, in, all the way in Ephesus, that claims Jesus was the, was a logos, a word. But we never saw this, and all the I am statements, I am the way, I am the truth, I am the life. If Jesus and every scholar worth his damn knows that this is a historical, why? Because it's not mentioned in any of the earlier sources of Mark, Matthew, or Luke, or the sources of them, which is Q, Q Quell. L or M or any of the earlier books such as the Apocrypha, uh, the Apocalypse of uh, Thomas, I think, and there's multiple more re more things. I'm not sure where you've taken the discussion. In regards to the Gospels, we know they are corrupted. They're, the scholars spend all their time trying to figure out what was the original uh, Gospel, and you can't deny it. You said these are wild claims, but you haven't engaged with anything I said. The scholars, for example, the ending of Mark, 
we know these are additions. If you don't class that as a corruption, I don't know what it is. You keep saying what is the benefit of these uh, corruptions. There are multiple ones, such as the commission to the Gentiles at the ending of Mark. It is there. And there are multiple theological reasons why a person can add the ending of Mark. What you have to do is tell me why they added the ending of Mark and why it still remains, if it's a forgery, why it still remains in your Bible today. So, again, so he appeals to this theory that John has the highest Christology. But if you actually look at the beginning of Mark, it talks about the verse I spoke about. It refers to John the Baptist. It refers to, refers to the verse of Isaiah 40 about one in the wilderness. It says, Behold, I send my messenger before your face, who prepare your way. The voice, in the, one, the voice of the one crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make straight his path. Mark is affirming the Old Testament prophecy that there's going to be someone in the wilderness who prepares the way for God. Read Isaiah 40. Read Malachi 3 verse 1. It both, both verses are God speaking in the first person, saying there's going to be a, a messenger before me. So there is no this whole myth, myth about Christological increases that goes to John. Yes, there are more explicit statements, but Mark starts with a very explicit Christological statement. So again, in terms of his other points, he keeps going to... Um, to Caesar being divinized. But again, this is why I'm saying we start from the beginning. We, he even mentioned, for example, Philo. Philo talks about a divine logos. That pre, even predated Christianity. The reason why that concept comes from before Christianity is because you have something called the Targums. And in the Targums, you had an, something called the Memra. So the Memra is related to that. And that's why, again, I say, look at the scholars, Daniel Schaefer, or don't Daniel Boyeran, they have done the research. He's appealing to Bart Ehrman. I am repeat, appealing to, and I read out his biography, the leading scholar of Juda rabbinical Judaism and Jewish mysticism. Who is Bart Ehrman, a New Testament scholar? Someone, the classical texts predate Christianity and they are affirming that actually Christianity's concept of the Trinity can be evidenced Listen to what I said, evidence yeah. to predate Christianity. When he says Jewish mysticism, a scholar in Jewish mysticism, yeah. what is Jewish mysticism? Is it mainstream uh, Judaism? No, it's Kabbalah. And he knows this. He mentions a fringe group, scholar of a fringe group so to represent... Judaism no, no, you, well. say, you said mysticism. And you, there's no there's no point in talking me about a Jewish scholar on Kabbalah and misrepresenting the whole of mainstream Judaism is is deception as based. Bart Ehrman is one of the greatest Christian scholars in Bible New Testament studies in the world and he knows and it's not just about what the text is saying you can see it in history Caesar was apotheo, uh, apotheos uh, like as he went through divinized he went from a man to a god it's not something to argue about. The Gospels were changed. No Christian scholar worth his dime can tell you that there isn't a high Christology in the Gospels. John shows the highest, the I am statement. If Jesus said this, why don't we ever see this before? It's not a question. You know this. I don't know what other things you're talking about, about Mark talking about the Old Testament saying this. It doesn't matter. It's not nothing towards what I said. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and then, sorry, Mark, Matthew, Luke, and then John. The earlier you have, the earlier Jesus is a man. The later you have it, the more divinized Jesus is. In, math, in Mark, Luke, and John, you see a process of adoption, that Jesus becomes God. In John, God was, Jesus was already God. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God. Now, one is working from down to up, whereas John is saying, no, Jesus was God, and then he came onto earth. But these statements are never to be found in the earlier Gospels. You don't find it in the sources of the earliest Gospels. As you know, the synoptic problem of Q, which is Quel, L, and M. They they don't ever speak about Jesus being God. This is a concept which comes much later, much, much, much later on. So, so again, he's appealing to Caesar. Caesar has nothing to do with the Bible. He keeps appealing if that people divinize 
Caesar, so what? What does that have to do with Christianity? Nothing. I'm giving you, and I said, he, the first person, um, Daniel Schaefer, he is a leading scholar in rab rabbinical Judaism and Jewish mysticism. He focused on the Jewish mysticism. So again, he didn't focus on the rabbinical literature. So this includes the Old Testament. It called, includes the Midrash. It includes the Targum. It includes a plethora of literature that current rabbinical Judaism Jews use today. And also, Benjamin Summer, I cited him. He is a Jewish scholar of classical sources. And even him, he says, what does he say? He says, for example, concepts that Jews use today is very different from what they use in the first century. Read the book of Daniel Boyeran, who talks about, he even acknowledged binitarianism. Where did these concepts come from? It comes from the reading of the text. For example, read Genesis 19.24. It says Yahweh rain, rain down um, fire and brimstone from Yahweh in heaven. It mentions two Yahweh. So when Jewish people are reading these texts in their own languages, because Muslims believe that the text of the Torah was given to people to understand in their own language. So within their own languages, they could understand that there was a distinction within God. Even if you read the book of Genesis, it says in the beginning, there was God speaking. You also had the Holy Spirit that was the Spirit of God that was over the waters. If the Muslims and Jews will say that's one God, so would we. That's the argument done because we say the Holy Spirit is a distinct person and the Father is a distinct person. So these are even things that can be evidenced in text. That's why I'm referring to the text itself because Trinitarianism comes from the reading of Genesis all the way to Revelation. Yeah, again, I feel like I'm losing you in this discussion, yeah, honestly. The concept. Yeah. Well, we keep we keep going. Yeah, two more. Yeah, yeah two, two more. more. And then the we'll original the topic, yeah, it was right. original topic. Yeah, we're gonna go for a break and then. Okay. Yeah, yeah. The original topic was that paganism influenced Trinity. Yeah, this is what you stopped me. I was gonna say something else, but you stopped me particularly on that one. And then you're saying that you, I'm talking about Caesar. Yes, because Apotheos is an example of a system where man can become a god in the society that Jesus lived in. So it's not surprising that people after Jesus may have taken Jesus as a divine person. Like we say, see that the later the Gospels are, the higher divinity of Jesus that we see. In the beginning was the Word and the Word was with God. So we see a thought in John's Gospel that Jesus started as God, which we don't see in the previous Gospels. We see a whole lot of I am statements that don't exist in Mark, Matthew, Matthew or Luke. So this is the whole point and you haven't engaged in any of that. You keep talking about the these heresies that these Jewish groups done. It doesn't matter. They're still heresies. I'm talking to the scriptures, the Jewish scriptures. Don't worship anything other than God. Your God is a jealous God. You should love only your God, not, not the calf with their worship, which is wrong. It doesn't matter if they've done it in second century, second uh, temple uh, Judaism. They even done it in first century uh, uh, Judaism. It does not make it right. The Jews only were told to worship one God. You keep on saying, yeah, but the second temple Jew, Jews, Jews, they worship this, they worship it doesn't matter. I told you they worship the cow. I told you they worship the angels. We know this because the scholars point this out. But it does not make it a legitimate, legitimate thing. Nor does it make it a legitimate source to say, oh, they done that. Now we can do that. Jesus was a prophet of God. He worshipped only one God. And he told the people worship only one God. We see this throughout the message of all of the prophets up until now. Again, he's, he's appealing to a straw man. There is no Christian on the planet of this earth that says we believe in more than one God. So he's attacking a straw man and he's trying to appeal to the audience with a presupposition that monotheism is not the same as uh, is not Trinitarianism. According to whom? According to his presupposition. This is why I'm appealing to scholars. This is why I'm appealing to Jewish scholars who have looked at the text. He keeps appealing to modern, to Roman pagan paganism. I'm saying they, the scholars have done their research. He's saying the Jews worshiped cows. They worshiped all these, they engaged in idolatry. We know that, it's in the scripture, but they did not believe these, they knew they were in error. So I'm making the argument of the belief in monotheism according to orthodoxy. 
And when I appeal to Second Temple Judaism, it's because that is where the earliest writings we get. For example, Muslims will say they appeal to the Salaf to get the best interpretation of the Quran, or the earlier you are, the better the scholars were. So I'm saying when Jewish scholars do exactly the same methodology, they understand the beliefs of the Second Temple Jews, because that's the earliest evidence we have. And there was none of them that associated with uh, a, a plural sense of God with a sense of polytheism. So I'm saying the concept of the Trinity, and that's why the Jewish scholar said, the model that Christianity employs is perfectly consistent with what he finds in classical Jewish texts. There's a reason for that, and those texts predate, uh, you know, Caesar being divinized or whatever. And even the mention of, for example, he talked about the Christology, Christology of John. There are more explicit statements in John. Yes, I agree. But also when you look at Matthew, Mark and Luke, you also see Christ, high Christological statements. And that's why I gave Mark, where it talked about Isaiah 40 and who John was in the wilderness. Okay, again, you haven't engaged. Yeah, no. You haven't engaged in anything really that I was saying. You keep dismissing the idea of apotheosis existed in that region at that same time, and it could easily be done with Jesus. As uh, the disciples believed Jesus was not God, they themselves did not believe he was God. And then to see that people later, the orthodoxy which you pass yourself to be, start worshiping Jesus. Yeah, this is not what the early Christians done. You know, it's only after time went by, some people like the Calirigians took Mary as worship. Some people afterwards say the, the, the spirit is not to be included to be worshipped. The formulation of the Trinity came in the 3rd to 4th century. You can't talk about orthodoxy, it makes no sense before the 3rd century. Read any book on heresiology, there were multiple Christianities with multiple books uh, and they had multiple authors written in multiple places. And it, each, each and every single sect used to battle and argue with each other. If you see some of the beliefs that some of them held, some of them used to drink blood, actual blood. Some of them used to cut themselves and some of them were charged with the idea of paganism, sorry, uh, cannibalism, because they used to eat flesh of humans. And you can read this in the works of Arrhenius, in the works of Epiphanius, and any of the heresiologists. Anyway, the pro so this idea, which gave rise to the idea that Jesus is a god or type of divine thing existed in framework in the Roman Empire and this is all that I was arguing in regard to the scriptures we know that they have been corrupted you did not engage with that Mark at the end of his gospel we know that's an addition that did not exist before John 3 16 the word begotten was added multiple places we know that the, the scriptures were uh, uh, corrupted, but you keep talking about this Jewish Kabbalistic scholar that nobody knows. Nobody cares what the Jews in the Second Temple may have done. Ultimately, their scriptures say only worship one God, and to worship three persons in one God is also as seen as polytheism. Again, you see, he's struggling even to engage with my point because I responded to his point about the theological model, but. Uh, John being the highest Christology. That's why I refer referenced the parable where Jesus is referring to who Jesus, uh, who John the Baptist was, because that is a very high Christological statement because the authors understood the meaning of this passage in Isaiah 40, which said there's going to be a one in the wilderness who prepares the way for God. So the reason why Mark starts with this very verse is because it is a high Christological statement. Then he tries to dismiss the scholars and say, well, no one who knows who these people are. Why? Because Muslims love Bar Ehrman. That's all they know. I'm appealing to a, some, a Princeton scholar and it says, read his biography. He is the leading scholar in rabbinical Judaism and classical and Jewish mysticism. This isn't a nobody. He's not at uh, some two bit university. He's at Princeton University. And he's got a book called Two Gods in Heaven. You can read Daniel Boyer in. You can read Benjamin Summer. There's plenty of work on this. That evidence that these theories go before Christianity. So he keeps appealing to um, Apostios or however you Apotheosis. pronounce it. And Caesar. That's irrelevant. That has nothing to do with it. I'm given evidence even within the scripture where, for example, in Genesis or in the beginning of Genesis or Genesis 24, 1924 where you see two Yahweh's. There are many other passages 
So that's why I say the reading of scripture and the understanding of the Trinity comes from a hermeneutical approach that is taken from reading the, uh, the Bible from Genesis to Revelation. And he didn't deal with any of those points because he said the Bible is corrupted. We agree there's variants, but none of them affect our theology. And I said, if you corrupt your book, that means you corrupt it to support your theology. So therefore, if he's saying the Bible is corrupt, the reason why the Christians would have corrupted it is to state Jesus is God and there is a trinity. But then he's trying to argue that it's not in the book. So that's why I'm asking, well, what was the point of corrupting the book if it doesn't support your theology? Yeah, but people, but honestly, I've answered every single one of them. For example, this one. This one. Yeah, yeah uh, because, just do your, your yeah, because, uh, do your, yeah, yeah. We can do, I'm not no, sure where you're going. It's like I feel okay. like I'm talking Last to one. the world because right. we talk about the the corruption of the scriptures such as Bart Ehrman and Bruce Metzger and F.F. F. Bruce and all of these scholars that you know that I don't think I should have to explain to you what the scholars say because you should know this as a Christian. They say for the, 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 the Matthew, Mark, Luke and John were corrupted and in it is evidences that there were multiple Christianities changing it. One of the examples that I gave you saying I'm not giving it, I gave you it. Why would they corrupt it? The Dossetians. Those who believe Jesus did not come in the flesh. John argues against it. So the biblical scholars say that the, the, there were changes in the Gospels to show that Jesus did come in flesh. This is a clear one. There's other ones. Bart Ehrman, he lists four of them. Four groups of where all the corruptions can be uh, put down to. You keep going, uh, it's like a circular kind of discussion. You keep telling me what Jews done in Second uh, Temple. Uh, period. It doesn't matter what they've done. You keep saying, but you've not given evidence. You keep saying these two Jewish scholars, these just do. You've not given any evidence. You just give me two spurious, dubious Jewish scholars that nobody knows saying that some Jews worship more than one thing, which is fine. It does not make it right or true because their Old Testament it says only one God should be worshipped. I'm worship. I'm telling you. What the Old Testament says, what the Torah says, you keep on telling me this Summers, Benjamin Summers and whoever, nobody knows them, nobody cares about them. They're capitalist myst mystics. It's got nothing to do, which is greater, some unknown scholar or the Old Testament. <laughs> and I mentioned about apotheosis because I told you that the belief that a man becomes God existed in Rome, where all of these ideas of Christianity developed. Again, so he's trying to, di I've given him a Princeton scholar because he says he doesn't know who he is, his work is irrelevant. I'm appealing to scholarship. That's what I'm doing. I'm making my arguments on scholarship. These are not any two-bit scholars. These are reputable scholars in their field. You cannot be called the leading scholar in rabbinical Judaism and uh, Jewish mysticism if your work is irrelevant. So I'm again saying if anyone wants to read their works, and I'll, I'll read what um, is said from their books again, just so we, so I can conclude on this note, and I'll address some of his other points. <laughs> so he says, the New Testament took up these traditions that existed in Judaism and did not reinvent, but instead expanded and deepened them. The elevation of Jesus of Nazareth as the firstborn of all creation and God incarnate, son of God, son of man, the Messiah. All these basic Christological premises are not pagan or other kinds of aberrations. They are rooted in Second Temple Judaism. Why does he come to this conclusion? Because he's done his research on it. So this is scholarship. This isn't me appealing to some Mansour or some two-bit um, <laughs> speaker's corner speaker. No, this is proper scholarship. And they reference where they come to these conclusions from. So this is why he appeals to, he keeps appealing to Bart Ehrman. So what? He appeals to... Um, Bruce this, Metzger, F. Bruce, F. Bruce, Bruce Metzger. Uh, you know, N.T. Wright, Dunn. Yeah, let me respond to that actually. All these scholars, one, uh, Bart Ehrman says the crucifixion happened. Does he agree? No. So he picks and chooses when he likes Bart Ehrman. The second comment they make, they say that there is no fundamental variant that affects the reading of our theology. You could take out the book of Mark, it doesn't change our theology. You can take out the book of John, it doesn't change our theology. You can take out the book of Luke, it doesn't yeah, change our yeah, theology. Yeah. Actually, Bart Vollmer doesn't say that. 
He doesn't say that. I could do your conclusions. Yeah. Yeah. Just so uh, again, it's like he keeps on saying arguments on scholarship. We have not heard him say anything. He just said these two scholars. What are the arguments they bring? We know Caesar lived. We know Caesar was a man. We know he was flesh and blood. We know through a process known as apotheosis in the Senate by the people that were in the Senate, he was voted into the position of divineship. From a man, Caesar within two years became seen and divinized into a god. This is not something which is unknown. You could just literally pick up any book on the topic all of the scholars in regards to Rome and its uh, religions speak about this when uh, when um, the Jewish wars took place I'll just throw this in here yeah? um, when the Jewish wars took place Jerusalem was eradicated Rome killed all of the followers of Jesus and all of the Jews and then they replaced Jerusalem with uh, Capitolonia Alia, which means the city of, of the pagans. And at the doorstep, there were three gods that was placed there. Three gods were placed at the doorstep of New Jerusalem. And these three gods were worshipped in a similar way that the Trinity is also worshipped. So to suggest that paganism somehow doesn't influence Trinity, it's not wholly true. You keep saying these you know second temple I keep saying the same thing again and again Old Testament is very very clear there is no worshipping of anything other than God there is no worshipping of anything other than God early Christianity that is the Christian people that the people that believed in Jesus after Jesus believed in multiple things like the Coleridians who believed that Mary was a God there are people that believe that the angels were God in early Christianity. There were some who were cannibals. It does not mean that they are right. And I feel like we're just going to say okay. the same thing so, again. So again. to conclude, because it's our conclusion. <laughs> so he talked about Bar uh, Ehrman. So for example, B.B. Warfield, he held four do doctorates in theology. He says, read it. The, the bulk of the New Testament has been transmitted to us without or almost without any variations. It can be asserted with confidence that the sacred text is exact and valid and that no article of faith and no moral precept in it has been distorted or lost. He mentioned Bruce Metzger. Yeah, yeah, he did. What did Bruce Metzger say? What did he say? He says, the more significant variations do not overthrow any doctrine of the church. Any good Bible will have notes that will alert the reader to variant readers of yes. in of any consequence but again these are rare then it goes on yeah. and Strobel who was interviewing him yeah. asked if scholarship had diluted Metzger's faith yeah. he jumped in and before he could finish and he said on the contrary Metzger stressed it has built it I've asked questions all my life I've dug into the text I've studied this thoroughly and today I know with confidence that my trust in Jesus has been well placed then he added for emphasis very well placed and then we also have one more. All right. Uh, Bar Ehrman. Uh, Bar Ehrman. He nah, says. The famous, what's his famous scholar? She, I don't have his quote on. The me it's about preservation. Okay, we'll but essentially, on. I've given Bar Bruce Metzger, which he um, mentioned. So I've given a, a statement that it doesn't affect our, our theology. None of the variants do. So he's arguing against a straw man. Where he's getting these uh, ideas from, I don't know. He also then appealed to Caesar. That has irrelevance. He's trying to read into Christianity what is not there. Then he said that Christians inserted a verse, for example, to uh, that Jesus came in the flesh. But then he's making my claim that I said, if you corrupt the text, you do it to support your theology. So then he's trying to say Christians corrupted the text to support their theology. So if they're doing that, that means the Bible does affirm that Jesus is God and there is a Trinity. Because I asked him the first question, if you corrupt the text, what is the purpose of corrupting the text? It's to support your theology. Yeah. Okay, so yeah. Yeah, you're clapping, the only fan you have there, yeah? <laughs> so good. Yeah, the only fan, okay. But, so, so, okay, let's just do a little exchange because uh, we don't really... Let's go to the next... Huh? Have a no, you're we'll saying that there's next. no theology that's affected by these changes in the Bible? No, none of our core doctrines. So. None of your core doctrines. So do you reckon the Bible changes or do you reckon the Bible never changes? In what sense? I've, no, this we, is a we accept this variant. Huh? No, no, does the Bible, the Word of God change? This is a doctrine. A doctrine way. It's a doctrine of Christianity that the but yeah, yeah, I'm saying within Christianity, we and accept there are variants. If you say, if you say now, 
<laughs> yeah, but Christians don't argue. Yeah, this, why is what, this is what Christians Mo Armin argue, argues. Okay. He did, he, you say that these variances, yeah, the yeah. hundred thousand, it doesn't change the doctrine of Christianity. The Christi yeah, it the, does. The, 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 belief, the, that, the, the belief and doctrine that the Bible never changes. No, the, the, the first principle of Christianity. <laughs> Jesus Christ. Without the death and resurrection, we have no Christianity. That's our primary. Uh, no, that's a primary one. Right. But doesn't you said no doctrine? Yeah, but people. See, but there are doctrines. No, but in terms of. Do you understand? No, but that's no, I'm not different. talking about core no, doctrine. Yeah, that's not something uh, different. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, we'll have a break.